Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second masterclass today uh, of the Hershon Artist in Residence here at the School of Media Studies at the New School. Uh, so our artist in residence this time is Mary Heron. Um, and today's masterclass will be uh, talking about, uh, again, recreating the past and her work and focusing on cinematography, visuals, and sound, among other things. We're talking um, about her films, and specifically today we'll talk about the Notorious Betty Page and the uh, series that uh, the uh, miniseries that she did for Netflix, Alias Grace. Um, like yesterday, please, if you have any questions throughout the uh, masterclass, you can just type them into the chat box in the um, in the live stream and at the last 30 minutes we will Mary will answer um, all your questions so welcome Mary and I'll just hand it over to you Hi there. Um, so yesterday we were talking about um, women's lives in the 20s uh, and that I felt like they their lives changed more radically during that time than any other uh, but with the first film uh, Notorious Betty Page, we're talking about the 1950s. And this, I think, was the most conservative time uh, in women's, in, culturally for women uh, in the 20th century. You know, for, for a lot of reasons. It was after, you know, the Second World War had allowed a lot of women into the workplace, you know, into factories and in, in supporting roles in the military. And so women had had this certain amount of independence. And when the war was over, there was a need to get women um, back into the house so that men could have their jobs back. And as often a kind of political or social need is accompanied by, um, you know, a cultural shift. In this case, if you look at a hol when I was um, immersing myself in, in this period of the 1950s, you know, in the, in the research process of, of doing Betty Page, um, Guinevere Turner, who wrote the script with me. We watched a lot of 1950s movies. And it's amazing how often in a 1950s Hollywood movie, you know, a woman has a chance to be, you know, like the first female president or the head of something or have some distinguished career. And she decides that by the end of the film to give it up because it's going to ruin her marriage. And if she has this career, she's going to end up tragic and alone. And um, and you realize when you when you watch these films that there's as strong an ideology being promoted, um, it, there's as much of an ideology as there was in the Soviet films, you know, of the 50s. It's just much subtler and much more fun and entertaining, but there's still a very strong ideology in it. So, so there's a lot of interesting reasons to look at the 1950s. I have a personal reason. To me, it was almost like understanding my mother's generation. And I think these women who were, who were given, so, my mother was a very brilliant woman and who, always said, I just want to be at home with my family, but I don't think that she really did. And, and I think that um, I, there's a way in which women were sort of took on their own, um, uh, the, the propaganda, you know, even though they could, they could see that they were not inferior to men. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the picture is very fascinating. Um, I love sort of 50s movies also because if you look at them in terms of sort of sex roles, and, and, and they're great movies, that's another thing, you know, it's, it was a real sort of prime time for Hollywood. Women are very female, you know, they all have enormous, you know, breasts and hips and the men are very, very masculine. It's just a time of very strongly, clearly defined sex roles. Um, the other thing that had, I had a personal interest in is that um, my first stepmother was a former Hollywood starlet and had had this sort of beauty career, um, queen career of, that is very classic in, in this period where it's a sort of poor girl who uh, starts to model or gets discovered. In, in my stepmother's case, she was in Stanley Kubrick's first movie, Fear and Desire, and then she had a sort of career at, uh, in the studio system for a few years. So I grew up hearing about my stepmother's life. And when I, I started researching Betty, I was also thinking about the, the lives of these women whose whose whole lives are changed um, because of, of beauty, you know, and what that does to them, you know, the good and the bad. So with Betty Page, I wanted to tell a story of the 1950s. Um, and I was also particularly interested 
in sex in the 1950s. So to, for those who don't know her story, just to recap a little bit about Betty Page. Um, she was a, um, a girl, who, nice girl who grew up poor uh, and religious in the South. She was from Nashville. Um, she wanted to be a teacher. She wanted to go to college. She, she was a bright girl, but she um, ended up in a teaching. She missed, her, she missed by one, one, mark, one point her chance to go to Vanderbilt University. So her life changed in that way. Um, she made an early marriage that was abusive. And um, she came to New York hoping to become an actress. And instead, um, she wasn't a great actress, it has to be said. Uh, but she was very beautiful and she was a fantastic model and she became a successful pinup model. There were all these sort of camera clubs um, um, in those days. You would go and model for like 20 or 30 people, um, photographers who would take pictures of you. And she was doing that and then there came a chance for her to earn even more money um, doing a series of bondage photos, fetish photos. Uh, and this was a very kind of, um, uh, these things were sold under the counter. And, you know, I think Betty, one of the big questions about Betty is she sort of knew what these photos were and she sort of didn't in the sense that she knew that men were paying a lot of money uh, for these photos in which she would put on these elaborate outfits of, of leather and corsets and she would be posing with a whip. But I think uh, to her, they were kind of silly. It was kind of like playing dress up. Um, so uh, when I first discovered Betty, there um, was someone showed me some photographs of her. Uh, there was a, some occult magazines, fanzines devoted to the images of Betty Page. And what was really, really startling about the photos was that this is this you know, very pretty girl in bondage outfits and she's smiling radiantly. Um, she, uh, you know, very cheerful and very, she's not looking um, uh, like a dominatrix at all. She's just like happy and, you know, she's like, she's giving a tray of milk and cookies. She's, she's as happy as any sort of idealized 50s housewife in these photos. And so there was a disconnect in the photos and the photos are also the backgrounds of the photos were very interesting. They all seem to be taking place in somebody's weird living room. There's like strange photos and lamps. And it's just like, this doesn't look like a, the, the, the backgrounds of the photos were weirdly normal. Uh, so I was curious about like, who is this girl? And then what made Betty Page notorious was that she inadvertently, innocently got caught up in a huge, sex scandal in the 1950s, which was that um, the Senate, um, there was a Senate subcommittee that was worried about the evil effects of comic books actually, um, and things that were being sent to kids in the mail. And it happened that because some of the same distribution companies that were distributing comic books that people were afraid were too violent uh, or had images that were unsuitable, uh, some of those companies were also distributing these little fetish magazines. Um, around the country to in um, plain brown wrappers. And so even though they weren't being sent to children, it became this big scandal of these evil things being sent to the mail. So poor Betty Page got caught up and used as an example of the terrible corruption that was hitting America. And we'll get to that later, but um, one, of the, one of the things that people when the film came out, some people sort of said, this is impossible. She must have known that the photos she was, she was involved in were about these kind of fetishism or you know, weird sexuality. And the thing is, she sort of didn't, didn't. She, she didn't really care. And in order to understand that, you have to kind of, when we were recreating the, the, the photo shoots in which she was doing her bondage and, and fetish photos, you know, the people doing them were um, this brother and sister couple called Irving and Paula Claw, who were just, they sold a lot of movie star photos. And then they had a sort of sideline that was very profitable in doing fetish photos. And none of them were really, they weren't 
into s and themselves. To them, it was just a business. They were very practical about it. Um, and in the clips you're gonna see, uh, this woman, Paula Claw, is actually played by Lily Taylor, who was Valerie Salamis in my film, I Shot Andy Warhol. Equally wonderful performance of a very different character. Um, and so Irving and Paula were just, they were very nice to the girls who came in and worked for them. And one of the very key things about these photos uh, is that there were only women in the photos. There were never any men. It was just women posing, sometimes women pretending to spank each other, women pretending to whip each other. And I think it was kind of, there's always the, the impression you get about these photo shoots that they were kind of like a big slumber party with people dressing up. So I think that that Betty's idea was that, you know, what's the harm? These are fun. I just get paid a lot of money. I'm not thinking about this very much. Um, and, and when it became a big scandal and, and she was sort of shamed publicly, it was very traumatic for her. And she, she suddenly had been, was told that what she was, had been doing quite innocently and sort of for fun and money was very wrong. So it's a, this, here's the story of the 1950s. Um, in this clip, uh, it's fairly early in Betty's career in bondage photography. And there's a British photographer who's a real life, was a real life character uh, who, read, who um, specialized in fetish photography and was a real fetishist. He loved bondage. He was like a Sims's life. Um, and uh, he's, his name's John Willie and he's played by Jared Harris who played Andy Warhol in my first film. Uh, and there's one other actor that you saw, if you were watching yesterday, that you saw, and that is there's a British uh, model, another pinup mo model, bondage model, um, named Maxie here in these um, scenes. And that is played by Kara Seymour, who is the girl, played the prostitute Christy in American Psycho. She's the girl running down the hallway screaming who gets um, killed by the chainsaw. So three actors from other films appearing in this clip. We want to show it. Ugh. Still not tight enough. I told you it won't go any tighter. I've been trying and trying for 20 minutes. You ruined the whole bloody thing because you're too lazy to do it properly. Oh, come off it. You set the shot up the way I told you. Okay, I got it, I got it. Betty, you were supposed to be at 10. You're not here, you're not on the clock. You're not on the clock, you don't get paid. Irving, you're in the shop. Okay? Bite that, bite that whip. Give it in the eyes. Give it in the eyes, darling. Beautiful. Can we see a bit of heel, maybe? A little bit of heel. Oh, that's, that's good. A little bit of bum. Oh, okay. I really like bum. That's perfect. A lovely bum, darling. Uh oh. See, she's one of our mess. And then he admitted that he'd pay Rose 12 bucks an hour and they gave me 10 cheek of it. So I says to Irving, pardon me, but who's been freezing her derriere off every Saturday for the past six months? Not Ros Greenwood. Oh, gee, that's not fair. And Ros is real nice, but you're a better model. Everyone says so. Hey, girls, how you doing? Yeah, we're cold. Can we get another heater in here? I'll see what I can do. Betty, you keep brushing your hair, it'll fall out of your head. I want to explain something to you. This is one of our private sessions. John, we call him Little John to tell him apart from the other John, Big John. He's the photographer out there. Anyway, Little John has some special outfits he'd like you to put on. I say they're special. Maxie, yeah, I, some of them are a real hoot, but he's a very nice man. Yeah, he's not normal, but he's nice. He's one of our best customers, so will you try and do what he says? What does she mean? Oh, it's nothing bad. You just have to scare him and act mean. Like this. Actually, it's kind of fun. <laughs> You're lucky. Won't you see what I have to do? Hey! Ow, just too tight! Well, that is rather the point, my dear. The tighter, the better. Pull off, Maxie. Are they hurting you? She's all right, aren't she, Max? Oh, I'm not. I'm getting rope burns. All right. OK, come on. Let's get a move on. Betty, stand over there. I'd like this young lady to look very strict. Mm. He'd like you to look very strict. Come on, my dear. More passion. Mm, fire. 
no uh, tigress. Hmm? Oh, very good. Dominate the men who adore you. Cross them with your exquisite high heels. <laughs> oh. Oh. So, um, the original title of the film was going to be The Ballad of Betty Page. Uh, and uh, the distribution company retitled it. But I liked the original title because I wanted it to be like a ballad, that it was kind of evoked a woman's journey, you know, uh, like a road movie without a lot of um, resolution or explanation. It's just like, this is, this is one woman on the, on the, you know, on her life's road. Um, and I wanted to capture uh, the, the weirdness, the, the, the surprisingness, the sort of illogical quality of real life. Um, and in, in that way, I, I started doing Betty, the story of Betty Page is a kind of anti-biopic. Um, because whenever I went to see the, the story of a famous person's life, um, it seemed to me that the, the writers always ignored a lot of what had happened, actually happened to that person in order to give the story a sort of satisfying, you know, conventional dramatic shape uh, and make it, you know, make it more, more logical, give it a dramatic arc. And very often that what happens in that case is that the story of whoever it is gets hammered into a kind of Hollywood template so that every story um, comes out the same. They're all, it's, it's always the story of rise and fall. And there's usually some triggering bad thing that happens. If it's a musician, it's always like some drug addiction. And then there's a moment of crisis. And then it usually ends with a, a moment of epiphany. And there's some kind of redemption at the end to give it a happy ending. And, um, you know, th that's kind of the, the story, no matter who, whose life it is. And life doesn't necessarily follow that shape. And, and the other thing is that when you, when, you know, when you, so I was thinking, why can't you just tell what happened? Even if it's, even if it makes the story a little less dramatic and a little not as smooth, you know, it would be more real. And isn't it interesting just to take one person's life and tell the story as realistically as possible? Uh, it's also kind of my documentary background you know, there where it's just like, well, reality is interesting, you know? Um, and I think that the more you, um, the more you look into someone's life, uh, the more questions you have. You know, why did they do that? Why did they, why did they, um, uh, there's, there was a case, it's a, there's a scene we show early on where there's, um, uh, Betty Page has this very awful sort of rape, you know, she, um, and early in her life. And, and, and it, you'd think that it would make her scared of certain things, but she just keeps going. And it's like, people don't react. People don't, you know, she goes, right on and people don't necessarily react the way that you that you think they will um in betty's case i think she just sort of buried it and moved on so so it was a, an unusual story in that sense of of the way the story is told was a little bit um unusual because i wanted to stick to what had happened um but the thing that that uh, that made that made it a little difficult to finance but what made it really difficult to finance was that i was determined to shoot it in black and white um and I just, from the very, very first of, of thinking about this story, I couldn't see it any other way than to shoot it in black and white. And uh, I was told kind of quite frequently that we can't finance it this way because uh, apparently people were worried that it would affect, this was back in um, the early 2000s, that it would affect television sales. Because they said, well, if you do a film in black and white and somebody it turns on and they see that film, they're, good, they're going to think it's an old movie and change the channel and no one will watch the film. But I was just, I just, I just couldn't see it any other way. And um, uh, I, I, co I couldn't even, I just knew that it, I would rather not make the film than not shoot, use black and white. And it's funny, then while we were, sometimes you, may, you have these instincts that are very strong and you don't know what you're doing until you've actually done it. And while we were shooting, the, the cinematographer said to me, he realized that 
using black and white gave the scenes a distance that stopped them looking stopped it looking like pornography it gave it in a sort of aesthetic distance was very important um and the other thing that that was very important about the black and white was it made it look like the past it made it look like the 1950s um, after there was a, t the film eventually got financed by HBO at that point had a, a small film, feature film provision. And we had a battle because they wanted us to shoot on video and turn the video, because oh, well you can shoot, you, if you shoot on, on dig digital, you can have it in black and white and then you can have it in color. And to me, you know, we did tons of tests, you know, weeks of doing different camera tests on, you know, video versus black and white. And it, when you shoot on on um, actual black and white film stock, um, because that film stock has not changed since the 1950s, um, they never developed it after that because everybody wanted to shoot in color. Um, the, if you shot it, it looks exactly like a 1950s movie. Uh, and I actually got, um, I went and got, uh, uh, advice from the Cone brothers and I talked to Joel Cohen and I said uh, over the phone I said you know they want me to shoot on, on video but because they had done a video um, the man who wasn't there digitally which they were able to shoot into um, and and they were which actually did look quite very beautiful but I said I want my film to look like a Samuel Fuller film from the 1950s and Joel Cohen said, well, if you want it to look like Sam Fuller, then you just have to shoot on film. You have to shoot on black and white film. And I'm so happy that I did because uh, it gave it just a, a great quality. Um, and the, so we, the, um, throughout the film, there's actually a lot of different film stocks. There's most of it is 35 millimeter black and white. But when we do the little um, uh, Irving and Paula Claw, the brother and sister team who ran this little this little film studio of, of bondage photos and films they would make these films that were kind of uh kind of low rent i mean the the quality is they weren't shooting on 35. so on that we shot black you'll see a clip of that later on in the in in uh this conversation um we shot on 16 millimeter black and white reversal which is very high contrast um at the same time as wanting it to be in black and white, I also always saw it from the moment when I first sort of started putting writing in the scenes where Betty Page used to go to Miami. She loved Miami. And I always saw that we would be in black and white and then there would be a blue wave, like a blue technicolor wave hitting the screen. And I felt like Miami had to be in color. Um, and I think there's a very obvious reason for that, for why that was thinking that way, which is that the the photos that uh, Paula Claw took in New York were all black and white, and the photos that um, that she took in Miami, which was actually um, another uh, female photographer. This is a famous female um, pinup photographer named Bunny Yeager, played here by Sarah Paulson. Um, is those photos were all in color, and I think for Betty, Miami, Florida was this place of escape and freedom and happiness. Um, so I wanted the color to look like Technicolor, which they don't make anymore. But uh, our cinematographer, Mont Hopful, managed to, to light it in such a way that I, I feel like our color scenes really do look pretty much like, like Technicolor. So in this scene that we're going to show now, um, Betty is told to take a vacation because um, her employers, Irving and Paula, are getting into legal hot water from the government um, for sending their, these films and photos through the mail. So uh, this is where it starts. It starts actually um, with Betty filming one of <laughs> Betty did these, they did some very weird little films. And one of them is called Betty's Clown Dance. And it's just, it's just Betty dancing with a doll wearing underwear. I can't, these, these were some of their films. So. Hi, girls. 
looks very artistic. What's it called? Betty's Clown Dance. Very nice. I go. <sighs> Oh, you look terrible. Is it your heart? Did you get the fluttering no, again? No, 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 I'm fine. Betty, that's all for today. Uh, listen, Betty, I hope you don't mind. We need to take a little break from production, maybe a couple of weeks. Sure. Take off. Take a vacation. You know where I'd go if I could ever get away from here? Where would you go? Miami Beach. That's where I'm going to go if I ever get to retire. Sit in the sand and watch the waves. Sun and fun, Betty. Dear Goldie, guess what? I decided to take a vacation. I've been spending loads of time on the beach. The water is so clear and so blue. <laughs> now I've been working too. A friend gave me an introduction to a photographer who takes beautiful artistic pictures. I hear she's one of the top glamour photographers working today. Her name is Miss Bunny Yeager. Miss Yeager? You must be Betty. Please, step this way. Would you like some water? Yes, I would. Thank you. Is this you? Yes. That was taken in Hawaii. I was a model, too. You brought some clothes with you. I made this. <laughs> Is this what you normally pose in? Yes. What do you think? Well, maybe the bathing suits and the stockings, not the corset. I believe the female form can stand on its own. In fact, I'd like to see you in the light. Would you mind standing over here by the window? What brings you to Miami, Betty? I don't know. Well, I love the sunshine. Love the ocean. Well, that's perfect. I do some of my best work outdoors. Yes, she's been shot by just about every photographer in the country. But I think I caught something special in her personality when I photographed Betty Page. The first thing I noticed was that for some reason, when she's nude, she doesn't seem naked. Maybe it's just her all-over coppery tan, or maybe just her attitude. Whatever it is, it conveyed to me that here is a true nudist. Betty's attitude towards her lovely, healthy body is the essence of nudism. Dear Goldie, yes, they made a postcard of yours truly. A bunch of them, in fact. Yeah, sorry. One, one of the things that uh, uh, you'll notice now is that we actually used some actual archive of Miami in the 50s. Uh, and in fact, the film opens with a white archive of um, New York in the 50s because, you know, we certainly didn't have the money to recreate it. But uh, there's an element. And then we, you know, we recreate these photo shoots and we recreate these magazine pieces and some of the covers. So there, there's a little bit in which this is this film is a kind of montage. It has it's quite sort of rooted in documentary. Um, one of the problems that um, that Guinevere and I had when writing the script of Betty Page was that she did not was not someone who talked openly about her feelings. And I wanted to to be to sort of honor that because very few people in her era did at least not in the way that people do now. Um, you know, it's very hard for, for people to imagine this now because we are all of us immersed in therapy culture. Therapy culture is, is universal. It's, it's, it's pretty international now. Everyone talks about their feelings the whole time um, and, it, and is quite confessional and revealing very personal things and, and, and on and on. This is even more true now with, with, with social media. And this simply was not true in the past. It was not considered um, appropriate for people to talk about their feelings. And this would be particularly true, I think, of someone, you can even see this generationally, I think, that older generations are, uh, do not talk as readily about their feelings as, as young people now do. Um, and the other thing was people did, absolutely did not talk openly about sex the way they do now. 
Um, it's funny, I, I was, uh, a few years ago, I was sent a, um, a script about the Bronte sisters in which they were sort of making jokes and talking about sex, you know, as if they were, were about having coffee in Starbucks, you know, and it's like, no, no, the Bronte sisters did not talk about sex in the 19th century, living in a remote, you know, vicarage. Um, so there's, um, I think that's something that's very ahistorical and it kind of, annoy, you know, when you see, when you see period films now, people are always uh, talking about sex as if there were no, you know, restrictions on that or no, um, you know, these were pretty, back in the 50s, America was a sort of pretty church going puritanical, extremely puritanical culture. Um, so what, so what, so that left us with a dilemma. I wanted to be true to the fact that Betty did not talk confessionally. Um, and indeed, you know, when she had this terrible rape experience, she did not tell anyone about it until she was in her seventies and finally talked about it in an interview. And that was very common. That's how people would react to any kind of sexual trauma. Um, but at the same time, um, I could see that the audience needed something to show how Betty felt about what was what she was doing, about about what was happening to her. Um, and it may be that we don't even have enough of that. That that the Betty, you know, it's tricky though because in some ways I I wanted to present Betty the enigma that was Betty. You know, it's very hard to 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 make to really make sense of her. And I kind of embraced that, but. At the same time, I, I felt you can't like deprive the audience completely <laughs> of, of a sense of her feelings about what she was doing. Um, and it didn't feel right to have one of those scenes where she talks spontaneously about, about what she's, what's going on with her because one of the things um, I think that helped Betty and many women in the 1950s to cope with the contradictions in their lives was that they didn't examine them very much. Um, you know, Betty would just move on if something was difficult. And it's, it's, it's like with the, um, with the sex photography she was doing. I mean, it's obvious that, you know, she was making photographs for men to masturbate over, but she would never think about that. She would ignore it. I mean, all the girls did, you know, it's just, it's just the elephant in the room that you ignore. But so, um, I decided to use another character in the film, the one played by Jared Harris, the fetish photographer, um, and, and, and have him challenge her. Because sometimes when, when, when someone isn't gonna talk themselves, you have to put them into a situation where someone is making them talk or is, 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 is like bringing these questions up instead of forcing it. Um, and because John Willie is an enthusiastic enthusiastic fetishist and completely like knows what he's doing. He was, he was a good contrast with her to make her talk about things she didn't want to think about. Um, and in particular in this story to get her talk, to talk about her feelings about religion. Um, because one thing about Betty is that she, she, even though the sort of story of Betty is that after the, the Senate scandals, she became a born again Christian and in some ways that was true. She did join a more, you know, in a sort of evangelical group, but she was never, she was always religious. You know, when you grow up in that kind of atmosphere where church and religion is such a part of her life, she never stopped and, and God was always important to her. So we wanted to, to, to get at that sort of paradox about, you know, Betty, Betty bondage photography and God in this clip. This is quite an elegant knot, really, as the more the subject pulls, the tighter the knot becomes. Mm -hmm. What the lawyers say? Not good. It's not good. Can I have a word with you in the office? Of course. Carry on. Y you're off the clock at nine. <sighs> My girls, the queen of all the acrobats, to see her perform would give you the bloody shits. She oh. can shoot green peas right out of her dirty arsehole. Turn a double somersault and catch them on her tits. Oh, 
She can run, jump, fight, fuck, roll a hoop or push a truck. And that's the kind of great big bitch who's going to marry yeah. me. Yeah. What's the matter, Betty? Yeah. Yeah. It's your language, Mr. Willie. No, oh, it's us an old army ditty. Help keep our spirits up while we were fighting the beastly hun. Don't you approve? I believe in Jesus. But of course you do, my dear. Of course you do. Do you mind if I ask you a question, Betty? What do you think Jesus would say about what you're doing now? Well, Mr. Willie, I've thought about this quite a bit, and I'm not really sure anymore. I think God has given each of us some kind of talent, and he wants us to use it. That's why he gave it to us. Mr. Willie, would you mind? I'm tying my hands. It's hard for me to think like this. Certainly. God gave me the talent to pose for pictures. And it seems to make people happy. Well, that can't be a bad thing, can it? Not to me, it's not. But what does God think? Well, I can't say for certain. I can't speak for him. I do worry sometimes about some of the things that I've done. What well, things? I pose naked for photographs. <laughs> Have you, my dear? You naughty girl. <laughs> but is that really bad? Adam and Eve were naked in the Garden of Eden. So they were. I don't know what God thinks about all this. I hope that if he's unhappy with what I'm doing, he'll let me know somehow. I'm sure he will, my dear. I'm sure he will. Um, I actually got my husband, uh, who's also a writer, to help me with this scene because he grew up in a very religious sort of Catholic background and I didn't, I thought I needed someone to say, well, what would, what would a religious person say? And uh, how would they think? And this was this idea of if, if God if God is upset with me, he'll let me know. And actually then shortly after this, this big scandal erupts. So I think she reckons that God has let her know. Um, so I just wanted to, to address this idea of, you know, why does it, why do you have, what, why does it matter about trying to capture um, how people talked in the 1950s? I mean, you know, what, you know, why, why bother in a way? Um, and I think it's, you know, it's because people talk that way because of their, you know, because uh, language affects, you know, you know, the way we talk is a product of our social and historical circumstances, you know. Um, if we don't talk about sex openly, people don't talk about it, it's because there's, there's um, social mechanisms in place to, that make that unsuitable, you know strength of the church, strength of certain, you know, moral conventions. Um, and then, so our circumstances reflect how we, we think and talk and then how we, our language affects how we think in turn. Um, and then people eventually come to think and talk differently because, because society changes, because history changes. Uh, how we talk now, you know, will seem strange and dated to people 20 years from now. Um, you know, people will be offended by certain ways, certain language we use uh, unthinkingly, you know. But basically, I, you know, times change because people make them change. And that's why, to me, it's important to, to, to be accurate about, about each period. Um, the last clip is going to be from the Senate hearings. Vlad, is there any questions that you want to raise before I go into that? 
Why, why don't we um, watch this clip and um, then I, before then we transition to the next one, then we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so this last clip from Betty Page shows uh, towards the, you know, the beginning and end of the film is it's sort of bookended with the Senate hearings into pornography. And uh, the dialogue in these scenes is almost entirely based on the, sen on, on the transcripts of those hearings. You know, you just can't make it up. And that's one of the things that I, I really love about um, doing historical research and writing a script and, and using, you know, staying close to the sources because, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And, you know, reading through these transcripts, which were really fascinating, uh, was how, how little, you know, people knew about about fetishism, about what they would call sexual deviation. You know, there was a very pretty much straight vanilla uh, presentation of sex in, in popular culture. And um, people were so mystified and, and alarmed and frightened about it. And, uh, and also just really didn't know what it was. And this is one of the things that when I had to do interviews about the film after it came out, it's like, no, Betty didn't know what fetishism was because nobody did, or, uh, you know, except for a very small sort of group of people who were into it. And in the course of, um, uh, of researching the script, uh, we talked to um, people, you know, they're all getting pretty old, but uh, we were able to talk to a few people who've been around then. They said, you know, it was such a sort of secret, secret code if you were into fetishism that if you saw sort of a woman wearing high leather boots, you know, in the subway, that would be like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, and there was a code word, maybe she's into the bazaar. And so you would like run and follow this woman through this and try and talk to her and find out, you know, and ask her, are you interested in, you know, the bazaar? <laughs> you know? So that was the, uh, and now of course, you know, post-punk, Punk was the thing that brought fetish gear um, into fa you know, into pop culture because they just um, the first punk club in London was used to be a fetish club, and it was this kind of underground world that that uh, the kind of uh, you know rebellious members you know in punk spirit kind of it was like saying screw you to the to society and embracing um, these really kind of supposedly outrageous or scandalous outfits, but they brought it into, into, into uh, punk fashion and then into general fashion. And then Madonna, you know, uh, used fetish stuff in her, you know, some of the stuff very similar to Betty Page outfits in her tours. And then you see it in the windows of department stores. So within a period of like, I don't know, 30 years between Betty making her underground fetish films and, and um, you know, the Madonna era of, you know, say the eighties, it burst completely open and became just absorbed into the general culture. And the same thing I think is, is true of certain kinds of, you know, what was called deviant sexuality. So uh, these were really fun to do, I have to say the Senate hearings. And I love um, of how uh, Mott, uh, the cinematographer, um, really managed to reproduce the look of those films. Uh, that we actually shot in the in the Brooklyn courthouse. By the way, I just oh yeah, before I show this, I just want to say a little thing about location. Really, for budget considerations, um, all of the scenes in this film and in in my first film in I Shot Andy Warhol were all shot on location. Um, and what we would do, both to create the Warhol factory and in this case to create the Irving Claw Studios, is we found a building that was about to be sold, an empty building, and took over the building. And you know, to create the Claw Studios, we had, you know, it was like a building in the East Village. We had the, a whole floor for the studio. And then we used, you know, the floor above for, you know, makeup and hair and extras holding and things. Uh, but uh, this Senate hearing, this, and I, I actually love shooting on location for the realism. And these, uh, the Senate hearing you're about to see was shot in the Brooklyn Brooklyn Courthouse, which has recently been surrounded by demonstrations. So here we go. This is the Senate hearings. You are Mr. Claw? Yes. Uh, Mr. Claw, were you? <clears throat> Sir, in accordance with your suggestion, we don't want any pictures. 
Thank you very much. We appreciate your cooperation. Uh, Mr. Claw, were you requested to bring any books or records? Yes. Do you have them, sir? I decline to make them available under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution that they may tend to degrade or incriminate me, and under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution that the subpoena is vague and illegal. Do you wish to make any statement as to why you think producing any books or records called for here might tend to incriminate you? I decline to answer under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution that an answer may tend to incriminate me. I direct your attention to the book entitled Cartoon and Model Ray, published by Irving Claw, 212 East 14th Street. I specifically call your attention to the movie Negligee Fight. The heading reads that this 16 millimeter movie shows the terrific battle that ensues when both girls claim a black negligee. Is this the masochistic type of perversion to which we were just referring? It is. Is there a, a sexual deviation known as bondage, where a person is trussed up with rope and chains? Yes, that is fairly common. You say that the bondage is fairly common? Fairly common in this particular group, that is the group of sexual deviants. Tell us more about that, uh, bondage being fairly common. Among those that are familiar with this variety of sexual deviation, it is a matter of common knowledge to them. You mean they like to see someone who is bound up? Yes, they do. Pictures of them? Some of them do. And I direct your attention specifically to a series of photographs called New Specially Posed. Betty can only feel fear as she is unable to see her captors. Now that the pole was bound to her body, Betty had to crawl on all fours like an animal. The floor made Betty's knees red and sore. The unwieldy steel brank kept slipping back and forth, irritating the tender flesh at Betty's neck, thus making the cold steel an added menace. It was most exhausting, but Betty's strength and endurance were equal to the task. Doctor, could I ask you, could, could, could children be sexually perverted by looking at photos of this nature? Yes. Would you say it is a fair statement that suicide, murder, and psychosis is the result of this type of trash? In some instances, yes. Um, and the... Um and the dialogue in that scene are, are, are kind of re reproduced from, from the real films and the real dialogue. I wanted to show a kind of extreme, one of the clause sort of extreme uh, bondage films because they are quite like, whoa, you know, kind of disconcerting. And I wanted to, that it wasn't all just kind of, you know, uh, playful, that they, they, they were fairly hardcore, um, but at the same time with no men in them and with no one actually being hurt and no, with no sex. Sex never took place in any of these films. So that's why, in a way, you, you can see why for Betty, it was just, yeah, that was a little uncomfortable having to wear the ball gag, but you know, that's okay. And you know, she didn't feel in many ways personally violated. Um, and the ironic thing for Betty was that the, um, the sexual harassment that she experienced or the sexual assault was in her, her either in her, her personal life, you know, uh, growing up or when she tried to become an actress um, and when she tried to break into movies and she was continuously sort of sexually harassed by producers and told that she couldn't. One reason why she didn't do better was that she didn't want to sleep with producers in order to, to get ahead, you know, to get a part. So for her, you know, the, the, this funny little world of these bondage photos was a kind of refuge from, a, from a, you know, uh, where she didn't feel exploited. It's, uh, it was uh, complicated. Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to say about the, um, the Senate hearings that I felt was, was an important theme and why I wanted to, to reproduce so much of the Senate hearings in the film is that they were an example of one of the moral panics that happens in our society every few years um, and at the end, when they say, you know, can buy, and one of them is the terror of, of the image, the terror. You know, so what they're saying, the end of that clip, when the senator asks, 
you know, is it possible that just look for children, if they look at one of these, some of these photos, that suicide or madness, psychosis will result from looking at these? And, and, and the answer by the, the, the psychiatrist who's um, been called to, to give advice says, yes. And we now would not think that, but the terror of the image and the power of the image is something that runs through the sort of whole history of, of censorship um, in the 20th century and, and into this century. Um, the, you know, and every time there's, a, you know, people are now terrified of the internet. Every time there's a new technology, I remember when I was, you know, living in London in the 1980s, people were terrified about VHSs and that, that children would be able to watch VHSs, you know, when their parents were away and, and be horribly corrupted by these things. So, you know, um, when, when you're doing a sort of historic film, you see both how society changes and, and also the things that, that don't change. So I'm, I'm going to jump in here before we, um, we we're getting a, um, a few questions. Um, but um, I also wanted to ask you um, specifically, I mean, I, I, you mentioned now, you know, what, what, what punk has done. And I know that I've read that you were actually quite involved with, you know, when, when punk, especially in, in, in England, in Great Britain, when it started. And um, I wanted to just get a general sense. I know for a lot of filmmakers, especially in the 80s, I, I would say music had played a big role. And not only music itself, but the whole culture and what, what emerged in the 80s and into the 90s. And if you can talk about that and in general, about all the influences that that shaped your your artistic uh, view in terms as a filmmaker, um, both from film and music and maybe other cultural influences, um, and how important do you think this is for a director and for a filmmaker to look also beyond films into the larger cultural landscape? Um, yeah, well, actually, punk started in New York in the in the mid '70s, and right. I, uh, and then went to London, but I. Um, I had been, I had spent my teenage years in London, grew up in London from the age of 13 and then went to university in England. And then I, I came to New York af after college and sort of by accident sort of stumbled on this very early punk scene in CBGBs. And um, at college, I'd been quite uh, sort of obsessed with Warhol and had, had written some stuff about Warhol and the factory and I love the Velvet Underground. And, and to me, when I discovered this little um, bohemian New York scene that was the first punk scene. I wrote for a thing called Punk Magazine that was the first punk fanzine that, that actually helped give the name, I think, to the movement. Um, and to me, I was like, oh, I'd found this, um, something that was a little bit like the Warhol factory um, in the sense that people gave themselves, you know, adopted names, you know, like Joey Ramone, you know, the Ramones, and, and uh, there was a little underground, and we used to call it, it was referred to as the underground. Um, and it, it had a very direct connection. The first time I ever went to CBG was Lou Reed was in the audience, you know, and, you know, Warhol used to visit and everything. So I felt like I had sort of discovered this direct, like, connection. Um, and uh, I wish, you know, at, at that point I was a journalist, young I wanted to be a journalist, so I did a lot of interviews, but I didn't, at that point, I wish I'd gotten into film and had, I had a lot of, I, you know, my best friend was a photographer, so I, I yeah, there was a lot of images being made, but I wasn't involved, so I just wish I had filmed what, what I was seeing and what I was experiencing, it would have been, been so great. Um, what I got from that, and then going to, to that summer of 76, I went back to London and I um, um, interviewed the Sex Pistols, and I was the first person from, when I went into the scene, they said, oh, no one from America has interviewed us yet. Um, so that was a sort of first, but I, I definitely did experience the, the first wave of punk in, in London. What I got from all that movement, I think, which I never lost, was the idea of it was very do-it-yourself. Um, you know, and I had just left college. It was my first year out, out of college, and my friends had gotten, a lot of them, very, quite establishment jobs. Uh, in the BBC or in newspapers and and I just sort of didn't occur to me to do that <laughs> I was just was wanted to see what happened and I found this group of people who who just decided to do something themselves with very little money and and the idea that you you don't have to get permission you don't have to get permission to do something this is particularly true now where you know with film where it's 
you can make something so cheaply. So you don't have to wait. And, and uh, you know, then when I tried to get into directing then for years and years, uh, when I did go into the system in the BBC, for in British television and try, you know, it took me years to get to direct. And some ways I thought, ah, oh, I, I was waiting for permission, but then, you know, finally I got my chance. But, but I've, I've, I held this idea that you can do it yourself when I just started writing scripts on my own, mm -hmm. because I knew that no one was going to give me the chance. You know, when I started working on the story of Valerie Solanas, no one paid me to do it. No one said you gave me permission. It was just, I knew I had to do it on my own. So, so that was, that was very important. I mean, you know, before that, I mean, uh, you know, I, I watched, when I was a teenager, I got very, very into old movies. Um, and I'd seen a lot of movies. My, my dad was an actor and, uh, and my, my parents divorced, my mother married a writer. And so, you know, I had, it came from quite a, uh, I guess an artistic background, but in those days, you know, children were just, just, tagged along to what their parents wanted to do. There was, there was much less like, what does the child want? What will we do for the child? It was just like, yeah, we're doing this, you, you, you know, you tag. So I saw all these art movies at a very, very young age. Um, you know, I saw like, you know, Bergman, you know, when I was 10, you know, um, uh, eight, I saw Fellini's Eight and a Half when I was 10, you know, I just, you know, so I saw all these art movies. I remember my mother being outraged because she wanted to see last year, they were showing last year at Marion Bad at a local theater and they wouldn't let the kids in. <laughs> and I was like nine. It's like, but, but the funny thing is, uh, I actually enjoyed them. You know, I just, I didn't really understand them, but I, I think I absorbed a lot of, um, I think I was very lucky to have seen uh, a lot of these kind of different movies, you know. Uh, I remember seeing Bergman's The Magician when I was very little. It was like 11, 10 or 11 and loving that. Another film was um, Night of the Hunter, big, big movie for me, still a big movie for me. Um, uh, so so th that affected me. But then when I was younger, I didn't, I d it never occurred to me that I would be to direct films. I didn't know of any women film directors. So it wasn't like I grew up saying, I'm going to make films. But when I was a teenager, I wanted to be an artist. Um, and so I, uh, and I was going to go to art school up until uh, I made a change when my English teacher persuaded me to, to go and study English. Um, but I spent, you know, I went to a lot of galleries, a lot of, and I still do, mm -hmm. museums. And so I think sometimes I have a lot of uh, art references. So I usually have, uh, you know, when I was doing I Shot Andy Warhol, I did, had a lot of Diane Arbus photos as a, as a key reference. Um, when I was doing um, uh, Betty Page, um, I sort of fell in love with Sam Fuller and these these kind of B movies, uh, black and white B movies of the '50s that just they were sort of gritty and sort of raw, and they weren't like Hollywood movies. There was just a lot going on in them, and and I wanted. I thought when I was doing Betty, I, I want to make a sort of gritty, sort of seedy B movie of the '50s. Um, when I came to do um, uh, Alias Grace, um, there was, um, oh, actually, you know, I should talk about American Psycho. When I came to do American Psycho, uh, I was very influenced by Kubrick and by um, Hitchcock and by Polanski. Uh, all people I know with, uh, with issues, but um, I have to say they were very inspiring to me. Uh, and it's sad, really, about very sad about Polanski and his his you know crimes because he actually did these very female centered films, uh, Repulsion and Rosemary's Baby, that were films within a female consciousness, and that was inspiring to me. But also, I was uh, always was influenced by a certain kind of cinematography, which is very wide angle, wide len wide lenses, deep focus. Um, and when I first started thinking about uh, American Psycho, it was very much Kubrick. Uh, and Polanski, I was I was thinking about, um, but I still I still always have, uh, and then I, then you know obviously I studied literature. I've been very affected by literature. I never didn't go to film school, didn't study screenwriting, but I think 
if you've read a lot of literature, you're, you're, it's all storytelling and character. And, you know, that was just, just not saying going to film school is a bad thing. It just wasn't where I ended up. Um, and then I always um, look at, still look at art. So, you know, um, when I was doing um, uh, Alias Grace, I was looking at sort of certain kinds of romantic English landscape photography, uh, so rare paintings or romantic English landscape painting. But um, I was also very fascinated. There's um, a 19th century photographer, the mid 19th century called Julia Margaret Cameron, one of the very first photographers. And I had in my little office when I was in pre-production on Betty, I had photos of, Jul of hers, her photographs all over my office. Um, and I just loved what she did. And she, um, they were portraits. And some of them were sort of out of focus, <laughs> which actually makes them very modern. It's very, it was very hard to get focus with these big, big lenses. And there's a sort of flaw and there's something just, just magical in them. Um, and because they, there's a mystery about what it's saying about women's faces or you'll see a lot of women. Um, and, uh, of what the the what's caught by by the lens, and I also that I've always loved, uh, and this has come to bring the answer right back to the beginning. I've always loved flaws in things, and one thing about um, punk was that it celebrated uh, the accident. It celebrated the amateur. So if you made a mistake, it was fine. Keep the mistake, you know. Uh, there was it sort of the it was sort of against technical perfection. Obviously, as I've, I've gone on, I sort of think you do try for technical perfection, but I have a great love of windows blowing out or things that are, you know, not, so I say, oh, so what, it's not in focus. <laughs> you know, the DP is like, no, it's not in focus. But there's certain things that I, I think you can explore that are, that are the accident. I love kind of certain kinds of quite rough footage. That's why I love Super 8. When I started my television work, I used to, I used to use quite a bit of Super 8, you know, things that are rougher. Mm -hmm. so. um, I, th I think uh, this is this is uh, connects all to a question we, we got from uh, Harshal, uh, our recent graduate, who says that I think we can say that I shot Andy Warhol has feminism as one of its core themes. Similarly, American Psycho has masculinity. So does your visual treatment get influenced by these themes or it's always more influenced by the character? Um, I, would, I would say it's influenced by the character, um, but it's also influenced by uh, the genre and the period, you know? So I think, you know, specifically American Psycho, uh, that was the most kind of high end world I did. And, and again, that was one where you wanted this, this very sort of flawless image because that was, that was about someone struggling, um, struggling to preserve, to control their environment. Bateman being the ultimate control freak and this person wanting, wanting kind of magazine-like perfection in everything, you know, in food and clothes and in, in morning beauty routine. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not necessarily a masculine feminine thing I think that's the kind of that's the kind of masculinity that that Bateman represented yeah. I mean if, if I can jump in here I mean this struck me that uh, from all of your films that I know it there are commenting in my view on you know or there are observing obviously the um, you know the female character and the kind of relationships but also a, a bigger social construct of the time when they're happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what attracts you to these particular periods of times where your films are set in and how, you know, I mean, you talk a lot about, you know, the characters and I think they're fascinating in terms of, you know, that you don't, don't pick the obvious, I would say choices. I mean, you talked about this yesterday, yeah. uh, very interesting, complex, layered characters. Um, so, but there's always this also, I mean, like we just saw in the Senate hearings and it's kind of always really interesting to see because through the film, you get this really kind of uh, 
also image of the society at, at large, you know, of like, you know, in obviously in, in uh, that, like the, the um, um, in capitalism, you talked about, you know, ran amok in, in the 80s, you know, with Jason Bateman, etc. So um, how do you, which are these eras of particular interest to you? Or is this something that you know, you find that connects to the material, or how do you how do you um, choose this? I th I think it starts with the character, um, and that I'm I'm interested in a character who are mysterious in some ways. I think that's definitely true. In uh, I think in all the ones I've done, there's there's an ambiguity. You know, uh, several of them, you don't know if they're sane or not. Uh, that's true of of Valerie Solanas. Well. Obviously, she had elements of madness, but uh, Grace Marks that we're going to get to next, the the, the central character, in Alias Grace. Um, but there's, um, I did a film, a sort of like a horror film called The Moth Diaries, where there, there's a question of madness. And, and in fact, I've just done something for Quibi called The Expecting about a pregnancy that is, again, there's a question of sanity, insanity. Um, and I don't know, but I think I, I just like things where where you have mixed feelings. <laughs> I find mixed feelings more more interesting. And I also I like things that I don't I'm not, I don't really like things where it's very black and white and clearly good and bad. Like even in the Senate hearings, the clip of the Senate hearings we just saw, uh, the main senator who is um, who's addressing the the questions, Eustis Kefauver. Um, who was a bit of a lech actually was 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 famous for like groping girls in elevators but he was also kind of a hero he was one of only two senators to vote for civil rights um so he wasn't like just a bad guy uh he was a very you know a complicated man and so i'm i'm, in, I'm interested in in that you know in in where there's yeah maybe there's heroes and villains but there's 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 a complications in, in each of them i think that's a great great segue to talk uh, more about uh, alias grace Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, um, oh, I was talking before about how I, I, I love things that, that try to get a really um, uh, knowledgeable um, sense of the period. And when I came to um, the story of, the, of Alice Grace, Margaret Atwood, who wrote the original novels, had done incredible, incredible research on the period um, of this mid-19th century period. Um, sorry, I've got my family yelling in the background. Um, Grace Marks was a servant girl um, who in the sort of 1840s in Ontario, where I'm from, um, was accused of murdering her employers, her, uh, her um, a wealthy man and his housekeeper. And she and another servant, uh, both Irish immigrants, were accused of this murder and the young man was hanged and Grace was eventually imprisoned um, uh, for 30 years and, and eventually uh, they obtained her release. Um, so it's a real life murder and nobody knows for sure what happened except for the people who were in that farmhouse when those murders occurred. Um, but uh, Margaret Atwood did fantastic research and she, she you know, did such a detailed evocation of the life of a, of a servant, um, of servant girls in, in the mid 19th century. And, you know, I'm Canadian and my family um, came over, you know, in the 19th century. And I was just stunned about what I didn't know, what I didn't know about my own culture. Um, I had no idea that, because I think of it as Canada, which is like, you know, kind of liberal, whatever, you know, Canadian spirit, apart from having massacred all their native peoples. But um, then I realized that in the 19th century, when uh, my me members of my family first came over, Canada was a British colony, and it was run with the ha extreme harshness um, of, uh, you know, even worse harshness that, than the British prison system or the British society. Uh, you know, it was not a democracy. It was a colonial you know, occupied country. Um, and we went and saw the, the prison where Jace Martin, great, there was a museum in the, in the actual prison that, um, that, that will be seen in the clips of where Grace Marks um, was imprisoned. And the cells were, were 
I was just stunned. They were narrower than a, than a mattress. Um, and that's where people would be kept for, for years. And they were horrendous punishments of, of whipping and beating. And there was a thing, I think in one of the clips we see just a quick glimpse, there's something called the box where people were would stand in a box with just a little hole to breathe and be left for hours. It was just like barbaric. I thought my own, my own society is barbaric. That, that's where, you know, uh, that's the roots of the, the society I was, I grew up in. Um, but I thought was even um, more impressive in some ways was how Margaret Atwood as a novelist had thought herself into the language and the thought patterns of, of, a, of a, a, a young girl, an uneducated young girl, poor girl in the 19th century. Um, because she, um, again, like Betty, um, Grace was a poor girl who was not used to thinking about herself, talking about herself, talking about her problems, thinking in any kind of modern analytical way about her own emotions. Um, and so uh, what, um, what Margaret Atwood did, and Margaret Atwood reflects that in the actual scenes of dialogue, you, you know, it's very believable. Um, but um, she gives she gives Grace this kind of very rich interior life, this quite poetic monologues that are actually um, more, you know, in some ways more educated, more eloquent probably than the real Grace would have been able to be, but it's a sort of artistic license. And, but these are, those are her inner thoughts she, that she gives voice to. But Grace in speaking is, um, uh, it's sort of very realistic about how she would have talked. So um, there's another thing where, where that, that uh, Grace Marx has in common with Betty Page uh, and that they were both notorious um, against their wishing. And they both became uh, blank screens onto which people projected their fantasies. Um, Betty, because she did these sexy photos, uh, and because she was um, caught up in these uh, the Senate scandal, but with Grace, it was because she was, you know, a murderous, notorious murderess, and so people, and some people thought she was innocent, and some people thought she was guilty. So, uh, in this very, op I'm going to show the very opening scene um, of Alias Grace uh, when she's looking into a mirror, and she's what she's talking about is all the different ways that people have seen her in the years since the murder. Um, and what we did was, this scene was only possible because I had such a great actress playing great, Sarah Gadden. Um, and because um, initially the scene was written and there were descriptions and it was supposed to show this mirror image of Grace and her changing all these different ways. She'd be wearing different clothes and different, be tall or you know, well-dressed, poor dress. And, and then I thought, I don't think I want to do it with clothes. I want to do it more with the face. And then I had these, I was talking before about having these uh, Julia Margaret Cameron photos all over my office. And one day the um, production designer came in uh, and he looked at some of these photos with these different, he says, oh, is that the same, is that this, you know, he, they actually looked like that. One of them was one of a sort of uh, um, ancestor of Virginia Woolf. And he said, oh, is that the same person or is that, they all the same person? And it's like, no, actually they're different people, but they're all different expressions. And I thought, oh, what you can do with just a close up? What if it's a close up of the same person, but they're becoming different people with their expressions? So you'll see what I mean when you see this scene with Grace Marks looking into a mirror and talking or rather there's a voiceover. And what we did, what we did was we filmed, we recorded the voiceover first, and then we filmed um, Sarah Gadden, you know, looking into a mirror and recorded her changing expressions. I think of all the things that have been written about me that I am an inhuman female demon, 
that I am an innocent victim of a blackguard forced against my will and in danger of my own life. That I was too ignorant to know how to act and that to hang me would be judicial murder. That I am well and decently dressed, that I robbed a dead woman to appear so. That I am of a sullen disposition with a quarrelsome temper. That I have the appearance of a person rather above my humble station. That I am a good girl with a pliable nature and no harm is told of me. That I am cunning and devious. That I am soft in the head and little better than an idiot. And I wonder, how can I be all these different things at once? I, I hope I hope the image was clear because um, it's a it's a wonderfully sort of subtle performance uh, of shifting of shifting identity um, and I think um, Sarah Pauli, the the screenwriter had you know who adapted the book really brilliantly um, had put this right at the beginning and I thought it was right because um, she wanted to say this. Sometimes your first scene is very important, and your first scene is a way of saying this is what this is what this is what this is going to be about in a way, and and by showing Grace in the mirror and the different shifting expressions and shifting identities, it's going to say, you know, this is about a, a woman and her identity and how people see her and and whether she was what they thought or is not what they thought and and. Um, all these questions and these these sort of mysteries are, are going to be at work. And I think um, Sarah Polly was very interesting about why she wanted to adapt um, um, Alias Grace and the way that that women, I think for her, and this is a woman of the 19th century, and this is a, you know, woman of you know modern times, but seeing the idea of, of how women in particular uh, are trying to adapt to expectations all the time. Um, and, and it seems to be something, one of the stories of women in, in, you know, throughout history, but looking at the last sort of century in this century, that women conforming to different ideas of beauty or of, or of, of goodness of, you know, of what other people want them to be. Um, so, um, like I said before, you know, uh, Grace is a woman of few words. But in the novels, you know, she's she's the narrator, and so it's her point of view, it's her story, and she's given this rich interior monologue. Um, but in in conversation, her her dialogue is much more simple. You know, her words. She's uh, still a woman of few words in the actual dramatic scenes, and um, throughout the the novel and in the TV series that we did based on it. A young doctor has come from America to examine Grace Marks to try and determine if she is sane or insane, innocent or guilty. Uh, and he's interested in a kind of uh, rudimentary form of, of psychology, which, which had begun in, in the 19th century. And there's, there's also scenes of, of hypnosis and you know, these early, uh, as they were, you know, early uh, attempts uh, of what, what would later develop into psychology. Uh, which is the science of the mind, people interested in how the mind, because what has happened is that Grace apparently has no memory of what happened during those murders and after, that she, that she has a kind of amnesia. And some people say, oh, that amnesia is, um, was, is deliberate so that she you know, didn't get hanged. Uh, and some, some people think it's a genuine uh, um, condition. So the doctors, this is the first time the, doc, the doctor meets her and he's come to examine her to try and determine her, you know, um, her sanity. He is a, you know, handsome, wealthy, highly educated uh, professional man. So, and she's a poor working class prisoner. So all the power seems to be in the hands of the doctor. Uh, but Grace actually, it, it, this is conversation is a cat and mouse game and Grace speaks very simply and she tries to give very little away. But by the end, you feel that, that Grace Marks, this powerless prisoner, has dominated the conversation. I'd be 
be careful if I were you. She'd murder two people in cold blood. She's in here for a good reason. Good morning, Grace. I understand you're afraid of doctors. I must tell you right away that I myself am a doctor. My name is Dr. Jordan. Dr. Simon Jordan. I suppose you're here to measure my head. I would not dream of it. Are you American? Are you the doctor they brought to write a report? Yes. Do you have a bag with knives in it? No. I'm not the usual kind of doctor. I do no cutting open. Are you afraid of me, Grace? Oh, it's too early to tell. This is for you. I'm not a dog. No, Grace. I can see you're not a dog. What is it, Grace? There's such an order of the outdoors. Can you tell me what it is? An apple. And what does an apple remind you of? Who shall we marry? I beg your pardon, sir. I don't understand you. I think you understand me well enough. Apple pie. Ah, something you eat. But I should hope you would, sir. That's what an apple is for. Is there any kind of apple you should not eat? A rotten one, I suppose. Are you a preacher? No, I'm not a preacher. I am a doctor that works not with bodies, but with the mind. Diseases of the mind and the brain and the nerves. No. I won't go back there to the asylum. Flesh and blood cannot stand it. They took liberty, sir. They don't listen to reason there, sir. Well, that is what I'm here for, to listen to reason. But if I am to listen to you, you will have to talk to me. You won't believe me, sir. Anyway, it's all being decided. And what I say will not change anything. You should ask the lawyers and judges and newspaper men. They seem to know my story better than I do myself. In any case, I've lost that part of my memory entirely. They must have told you that. I would like to help you, Grace. If you will try to talk, I will try to listen. My interests are purely scientific. It is not only the murders that should concern us. Perhaps I'll tell you lies. Perhaps you will. Perhaps you will tell them without meaning to. Perhaps you will tell them deliberately. Perhaps you are a liar. There are those who said I am one. That is a chance you'll have to take. Will they take me back to the asylum? <coughs> or will they keep me in solitary confinement with nothing to eat but bread? You have my word that as long as you continue to talk with me and do not become violent, you will remain as you were. I have the governor's promise. tomorrow then. The apple of the tree of knowledge is what you meant, Dr. Jordan. Good and evil. Any child could guess it. Yeah. So, um, uh, these conversations uh, continue throughout the, you know, as, he, as him, trying, uh, him trying to unlock the mystery of, um, of grace. And as she talks to him, in flashback, um, Grace's life is revealed. 
uh, I realized when I was looking over these clips, I didn't choose the most cinematic ones, but we, <laughs> I should have, as we're talking about historical reconstruction, we did um, recreate on, on in the studio, the whole um, Atlantic crossing with the, you know, the hole of a ship and water and everything, which um, now I'm wondering why I didn't. Anyway, but it's on Netflix episode one. You can see it there. Um, and one of the things that I was trying to do uh, in that scene was um, make it as, as disgusting as it would have been in real life, where people were stuck, you know, below ship um, for weeks at a time, people throwing up and, you know, being sick and everything happening, you know, in public, as well as dying of cholera. Uh, anyway, so uh, Grace, we, you know, as we followed the story of Grace, of what leads her to this farmhouse in the country <laughs> where this took place, um, she gets a job, um, she first gets a job in a wealthy household and she makes um, a great friend, uh, her, her closest friend, um, who uh, becomes pregnant and, uh, and whose life is, ends in disaster. Um, and she's very haunted by this of what happened to her friend then she goes and gets a job um as a servant for a wealthy man in the in, in the countryside um and the housekeeper who hires her who names nancy is played by anna paquin um the housekeeper is also his mistress which is a source of great sand scandal in the community um but again grace uh, much like Betty Page, doesn't see what she doesn't want to see. And and even though it's it, it, the signs that that uh, Nancy is actually sleeping with the, the master of the house are, are pretty obvious, um, she she has sort of shut her eyes to it. And Grace is um, um, quite puritanical. And this is one of the things that I really liked about, about Ma Margaret Atwood's creation of this character. You know, um, a lot of the time there's a temptation when you're when you're writing a sort of central female character to, is to make her a sort of conventional feminist heroine and to give her all the attitudes that you would like her to have. But Margaret Atwood did not do this with, with Grace. Um, and she knew that that a 19th century servant girl is not going to have um, the, you know, attitudes of a feminist in in, you know, the 21st century, you know, uh, and so Grace is a sort of, you know, North, she's from Northern Ireland. She's, she has all the Puritanism of that. And um, when she realizes what's going on, um, that Nancy's sleeping with the mass is his mistress um, and that she's also pregnant, um, Grace is quite shocked and disapproving. Um, and uh, in the end, um, she doesn't feel like it's fair knowing that her, that her friend Mary had suffered when she got pregnant. She doesn't feel that it's fair that Nancy should not suffer. So uh, here is um, uh, when Grace, um, Grace realizes Nancy's pregnant. Well, Grace, where is your mistress? She's not at all well. She's lying down upstairs. But if there's anything to be brought to you, I can do it myself. I should like some coffee if it's not too much trouble. It's no trouble. Though it might take time, I have to build a fire again. When it's ready, bring it in to me. Thank you, Grace. Are you feeling all right? Yes. What are you doing stirring up the fire? Mr. Kinnear wants me to make him some coffee and take it into him. But I always take in his coffee. Why did he ask you? Because you yourself were not here. I was only trying to spare you the work as you said you were feeling ill. I'll take it in. And Grace, this afternoon, I'd like you to scrub this floor. It's very dirty, and I'm tired of living in a pig pen. Clean it up.
Don't walk on my clean floor with your mucky boots. Don't you have anything better to do? You're not paid to stand there and go. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No, there's no harm done. What is it? What are you doing here? Scrubbing the floor, ma'am, as you ordered me to. You're talking back. I'm sick of your insolence. All I wanted was a second cup of coffee. I'll make it. Grace, you can go. Where am I to go, ma'am, with the floor only half done? Anywhere out of here? And for God's sake, pin up your hair. You look like a common slut. I will be in the library. Close your mouth. You'll catch flies. Go get yourself cleaned up. I need you to help me with a new dress. None of the old ones fit anymore. All at once it came over me what was the matter with her. I'd seen it before. She was in trouble. Stop staring at me. I felt my heart going hard like a hammer. It cannot be. Mr. Kinnear knows she was pregnant. I could tell he did not know. And I wondered what he would do when he found out. Put her into a ditch, marry her. I had no idea. What did you hope for? I cannot rest easy with either of those futures. I wish Nancy no harm, but all the same, it would not be fair for her to end up a respectable married lady with a ring on her finger. It would not be right at all. Why? Why would that not be right, Grace? Because Mary had done the same as her and had gone to her death. Why should one be rewarded and the other punished for the same sin? Um, so both Grace and Nancy are, are victims of this 19th century society where, um, you know, poor girls have almost no resources. And if, uh, and in this case, um, in Nancy's case, she was abandoned by someone uh, who she thought was going to marry her. Um, classic story that you see in many 19th century ballads and stories of the girl abandoned. And in this case, she's found a refuge by you know becoming the mistress of this wealthy man. Um, so they're both victims, but they're also um, at each other's throats, you know, because. Um, Nancy is threatened by Grace, and indeed the, the master of the house has started to come on to Grace and is maybe thinking of replacing Nancy with her, which makes Nancy, you know, terrified. And then Grace disapproves. Grace does not have compassion for her, really. She, she adopts the values of this harsh society and condemns her. And I think what, you know, uh, what Margaret Atwood is saying here is that, you know, oppression enslaves the mind. Um, and that's something that I think I've been interested in ever since, you know, reading Valerie Solanas, that one of the problems with an unfair society is that, is that people sort of absorb the values of that, of that absorb that oppression uh, and adopt the values of the society that's oppressing them. So, you know, um, um, Nancy and Grace, instead of, you know, they don't join forces. They are at odds. They are battling each other. And in the end, and there's a question, um, um, Nancy and the master are murdered and Grace has some kind of involvement in it. So it's, um, in some ways, I think Margaret Atwood's interested in, in the way that people behave almost like rats in a cage when they're, when they're um, um, suffering. You know, that, suffer that suffering does not necessarily make you... Um, have the great ideas, you know, the, the most tolerant ideas. It can make people turn on each other. Um, the other sort of, uh, before we take questions, thing that I wanted to say about Alias Grace is that, which I admired in the, um, in the text, in the, in the original book and in, in Sarah Pauli's adaptation, is that it was very, very good on housework. And there was a tremendous amount about housework. And you realized, um, and even when we were filming, what an enormous amount of time, women's time was spent just on work, really from, and especially with those young servants, from dawn to, to nighttime, they were sort of slaving. The simplest thing, make me a cup of coffee, involves starting up a wood fire or chopping wood, making the fire, you know, um, you know, trying to boil the water. And then everything was this, you know, you know, tremendous burden of, of domestic labor, which you almost never see in a period film. You know, when you're in Downton Abbey, you're not really seeing um, 
uh, the, the vast amount of work that's taken it takes to keep any household going. Nor are there's also a sort of fiction that servants love their masters, uh, you know, and admire them. And really, I think that the um, the Margaret Atwood version is a lot more accurate. That there was usually a, a lot of resentment and hatred. Um, and in this case, what's interesting, there was a particular resentment for someone like Nancy, who, who was just a little step above. Nancy had managed to get a little bit of authority over the other servants who hate her for that because it's like, she's the same as us. Why is she jumped up? And why is she, you know, telling us what to do? So there we go, Elias Grace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, that was great. Uh, we have quite a few questions, so I want to jump right in um, so that we manage to answer all of them. Um, so there's a few questions about different aspects of your um, working process. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the questions I have here is uh, from Julermina Zabala. How would you describe your process when developing the cinematographic look of a film? How do you collaborate with your DP? Do you use storyboards? Um, it's funny, I, I'm not a big storyboard person. Um, I've started doing them more um, on any big action scene. Um, the last thing that I did, which had a lot of visual effects and sort of action things, I, I actually, we had to use them quite a bit. Anything with visual effects. Um, and, and indeed when we did the, in Alias Grace, when we did the, um, the ship scene, which was so complicated where, where there's water pouring into the ship and everything, we, we, um, we blocked that out in fairly detailed. Because you know you only have, you know, several, it's expensive to reset. Uh, but I mean, on I Shot Andy Warhol, I didn't do any storyboards. On the film that we're gonna see tomorrow, we talk about tomorrow, Charlie says, I didn't do any storyboards. Um, what I have instead, you know, so in, in, each, in each one, it's, um, uh, it's a conversation that starts with the overview of what it's going to look like and do we have, you know, resources. So I was saying with, um, I saw Andy Warhol, I was talking to Ellen Chorus, it was a lot of natural light. Um, we knew we didn't have, um, we are, our, our, that film was under $2 million. So, you know, we just had, a lot of it was on, on tripod or handheld or handheld on the dolly. There was no steady cam. Uh, with Betty Page, you know, this is interesting about, about uh, um, the technicalities. Um, not only did we shoot, um, and some of these decisions really have to be done, you know, in advance. Um, we, not only did we shoot on black and white and do all these um, tests on film stock and sort of fight for what we wanted. Um, there was also the idea that we would only shoot on lenses that were available during the time. That meant that we did not use any lens um, wider than a 50 film lens. And it's funny, my, my husband, who's also directs, is um, um, became my kind of lens police because he looked at my first day's dailies and he said, "That's a, you used a or the second day dailies and they used a 65." It's like, "Oh, oh, you're right. I guess it is." And I went and said, "Ma, you used a 65," and he said, "Well, you know, we were hurrying, we were rushing, and it's like we, it was easier. It's like." No, we're going to have to be the lens. We're going to, have, we just have a rule. And if we, if we have to go tighter, you have to move the camera because otherwise it's not going to look like a 1950s film. And this whole thing that we've set up isn't going to work. So most of that film was shot on one lens, uh, which is also uh, Polanski's favorite lens. I think he shot almost all of Rosemary's Baby. It's, it's like what you would call either 27 or 28. Um, and so th that really, and I love having certain restrictions like that. You know, because if there's too many choices, you don't have a style, you know, and, and I love I love that. So um, that was a decision we made. And then I think people find me irritating to work with sometimes because um, what I really like to do, and if I had my way, is I would just get everybody on set and run the scene with the actors, and then I decide how to shoot it because... You know, I like to have a basic um, idea in my head, but that I want to see what the actors do. And I'm still very much someone who came out of documentary, um, and and I find it hard to to really visualize action if I'm not seeing it. 
Um, and I like just to see the actors in the actual space. And then I kind of know, then, I, then the scene is kind of unlocked for me. And I see the angles and I can see what we see in the background and I see the context for it. Um, with um, uh, we, yeah, with American Psycho, th th again, there was an o there was um, an overview, which was when I met with um, Andrzej Sekula, who is a Polish cinematographer, who actually had also shot Pulp Fiction. And I knew that he had a very, he also had this very Kubrick look, you know, he used wide angle lenses and everything. Uh, and deep, and we agreed, wide angle lenses, deep focus. Uh, and he had banks of lights on set. It would take two or three hours of prepping lighting every day that we weren't able to shoot because of Andre's very elaborate lighting. Um, and in some ways it was very kind of rigid because there were certain things, we, you know, resetting was difficult, but it did have a fantastic look that was really, really right for it. Uh, but we didn't storyboard anything in that. Uh, we weren't actually didn't get on very well in the end. We weren't really speaking. So, <laughs> uh, but luckily we had established the, uh, and normally I do get on well with the DP. Um, we had established um, a style that I think really went. He did a fantastic job in it. So I'm most concerned with, with the general principles. I start with a kind of a vision of, of how it should look and these certain references that may come from paintings, photography, film. Like I have an overview. And then within that, I don't really, you know, and I know for, for you know, some, you know, and then I go through the script with the DP and we kind of block it out and we map it out and kind of shot list it. But, you know, I don't really like to keep to the shot list, you know? It's useful to have. What I like about doing the shot list is it makes you think something through. You have to talk through the scene and try and visualize. And it's just a kind of, um, it's a kind of busy work that you need to do. You know, you need to, you need to force yourself to, to address the scenes. You know, it's easy to just not actually look at it when you're in prep, not actually really take it apart. So both rehearsal is good for that. And then, um, and that, that pro process of kind of writing down basic shots. But on, on Charlie Says, you know, we didn't even write out very elaborate shot lists, but I was had a very good rapport with the DP and he did a lot handheld. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Um, but we had overviews that, that I'll talk about uh, and references. Uh, and I think with, um, with uh, Alias Grace, you know, we, we were trying to do something, you know, there's always a conversation about what kind of film is this? You know, what's your big idea? The big idea here is let's do a period film, but not make it look like um, an overly lit, overly sanitized period film. Mm -hmm. So that was really about natural light, letting things go dark, that kind of thing. Yeah, it looked really great. I mean, all your films look really great. I have um, two questions here, which I'm going, which are, you know, kind of connected, I think. One uh, from Bill Pace, who is our um, teacher screenwriting as a filmmaker too, uh, here at the New School. Uh, I'd love to hear how you talk to the actors about creating their performances. This was specifically referring to Betty Page. And there's also uh, connecting to talking to working with actors um, is uh, Jules Alvarga, who asks in your films. Uh, and also in the Alias Grace show, do you usually have the actors deliver the, their dialogue word for word as written in the screenplay or are certain screen, uh, scenes open to their own improvisation? Um, the two films that were based on novels, uh, American Psycho and Alias Grace, uh, we were extremely um, literal, kept absolutely to the dialogue. And I remember when we were first rehearsing on, on um, American Psycho, Jared Leto came in and Christian and I were there and he was trying to, I was like, let's just have fun with this. Let's play around. Let's like, you know, just improvise. And we're like, no, we're not improvising. This is, this is as written. Because it was such a sort of stylized world and Brett's dialogue was so specific, you could not improvise. You couldn't mess with it. I did let people improvise um, on other things, on the more documentary films. Um, I'm sorry, Andy Warhol, there was some, um, Betty Page, there was a little bit. Um, in fact, you could hear Jared Harris improvising when he's saying, oh, you've got a lovely bum, darling. My readers like bum. And that's sort of, 
Jared just throwing something in, which is funny. Um, and as you'll see tomorrow on um, Charlie Says, I let Matt Smith improvise a great deal. And I'll talk about why I did that. That performance is tremendous. And, and he said before he took the part on, I'll do it, but can I improvise? And I, and I was like, yes, I think in this case it's appropriate. But with, with again, with, with, with um, Alias Grace, it's a very um, uh, specific world and, uh, and, and style and it's period dialogue. And, and I'm always very reluctant to let people improvise too much when it's a, you know, really that much of a period film because people aren't gonna, people will make it too modern. But also we were working very, very closely with Sarah Pauly, who was an executive producer and kind of very involved in it. And, and Sarah was in all the rehearsals. Um, and if we wanted to change the line, then we would do that with her. But one thing I did with with um, um, with Sarah with Sarah Gadden playing Alias Grace in terms of working with actors, because we were it was very daunting. You know, I had done movies, but I and I had done single episodes of TV shows, but I had never done six hours of something. It's like, oh my god, how are we going to do this? And and Sarah was too, and so we decided to meet and talk about the role. And she said at our first meeting, I think I should read the script to you. I'm gonna read all the scripts to you out loud. And so I would go to her house and you know, we would have dinner or we'd, you know, she'd make dinner and we'd sit and she would read the scripts to me, all the parts, and I would make notes. And every so often I'd say, let's talk about this. Let's talk about Grace here. And we, we you know, cause it was helping both of us imprint the, the these six scripts in our minds, but also in the process of talking about them, we developed three different modes because Grace is, um, you know, this shifting identity. Is she good? Is she bad? Is she innocent? Is she guilty? So we had what we call, we had three graces. One is good grace, the innocent grace. One is bad grace, which I particularly loved when she did bad grace, um, which is in some of the flashbacks that are the version where she is guilty. And then there was a, a grace we called neutral grace. Um, and that is a very calm, reflective, it's more the voice of the older Grace looking back, which is almost like Grace looking back from, from the afterlife, you know, a bit like Valerie when she read the manifesto, it's just calm and neutral and nothing bothers her anymore. It's almost like she's already dead because when she was in prison, it's like she was already dead. And after the murders, there's, a, there's a, an element in which she died and never, you know, even though she's physically still alive some kind of her life was over after those murders. So it's that very calm, reflective grace. And in when shooting, I would just run up to her in between takes and say, now we're gonna do good grace, or let's do this one neutral grace. And that gave us a shorthand. Um, so while, 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 we were, uh, while you were talking about this, actually Bill uh, posted a, a follow-up question. Um, which is how do you approach creating a safe set on a film dealing with sexuality? That's interesting. Um, uh, on American Psycho, um, where there weren't such things as intimacy coordinators or anything like that, I just, you know, sex scenes are very awkward and difficult. And my approach, which I just did instinctively, was also to be very comfortable with the actors, but also to approach it almost like I was doing sports and approach it in a very sort of brisk way. <laughs> okay, these are the moves. You're gonna do these moves and then those moves and then those moves so that you know, you're not trying to find the scene. And that's one thing I really try not to do. I to, those I try and work out the moves pretty very specifically in rehearsal so that we don't have to have, because I think sex scenes are always best. Sex and violence are best when shot quickly. You know, you don't want to just immerse people in it for too long and you want to get the best out of them and not make it too horrible an experience for everyone. And with sex, which is quite embarrassing and weird, you know, to be doing these things in public. Um, uh, the, in some of the big, very explicit sex scenes, um, Christian Bale and I had um, talked about and we, I said, you know, um, Bateman, you know, is always looking at video or images to try and learn how to do things. And like he would look at GQ to learn how to dress. Um, and he would look at porn to how to have sex. So we, one of the assistants went out and got each of us a sort of, I said, get, get, we'll each look at porno movies which have threesomes in them. So, so we looked at them. I can't remember what even they were called. And Christian came in the next day with little diagrams 
and said, OK, these, <laughs> these are the setups in the film I just watched. And they were, they, were just, they were very funny, terrible porno films. And so these are the positions because we wanted them to be sl- absurd and, and slight over the top. And, and, and they don't even anatomically make sense, I think. But we did all these like crazy positions. And I was like, OK, now we do this one. Now we're going to do the next one. And, and there was laughter. And, and I just tried to keep it you know, brisk and not unpleasant. I don't believe in like, oh, getting people into it and getting to feel all sexy. Because also these particular sex scenes were about prostitutes and um, and a client. And there was been no real erotic feeling for the women at all. The women are just, and deliberately I filmed them being very bored by them. I'm like, <coughs> and the thing I just did um, for Quibi, the expecting that hasn't come out yet, uh, there were these sex scenes and we did have an intimacy coordinator on set. And actually it was very good. Um, uh, because it's a young actress, Anna Sophia Robb, and you know, she had never done scenes like this before. And I was very glad to have the the intimacy coordinator was good. The intimacy coordinator would actually ask the actress to do more than I would in a way, saying, like, well, if you, you know, arch your back like this. And I was like, Oh, good, this is this is a, a healthy thing. But again, I try, you know, when I do rape, when I do violence, I always try and do just, I really try and do it like three takes at most. Sometimes there's a rape scene in Alias Grace, one take. That's all. That's all we needed. And I, I'm not going to make somebody do it again if there's no need. Um, there's a question we, uh, that we didn't talk really much about the music and the sound. So Shreya asked oh. about the music in American Psycho was quite nuanced while mm-hmm. echoing the sinister intent of Bateman. What was your thought process for selecting the movie soundtrack? Uh, were you trying to illuminate something deep with the pop culture era through its soundtrack? And I think maybe you can talk about generally your use of sound and music in all the different movies yeah. because they also relate to the different times. Yeah, I mean, American Psycho is a big sound movie actually because it is sort of abstract. Um, uh, there are three big scenes in the book which are just chapters on Bateman's favorite music. And I had the idea to turn those into monologues which he would recite, start talking to people about Huey Lewis or, you know, Phil Collins before, which is just before he's about to, to do something terrible. Um, so those, those songs, Whitney Houston, Phil Collins, Huey Lewis were, were part of the book. And then we had to find other so- songs. And what we found was that the more bright and upbeat the music was, the more sort of shallow pop it was, the better it worked. Having really dark or moody pop, do, just just didn't work, you know? So uh, when Bateman's going into the office for the first time, we, we use Walking on Sunshine, which just, when we play that, it's like, that's perfect. That works so well. Um, in other movies, like the the music's very important. In, um, in I show Andy Warhol, we used, um, I used a lot of uh, sort of sample, the Masquenada, I used this sort of Latin music because it was very popular at the time. And uh, in the scenes where Valerie's walking around panhandling, we have these very upbeat um, um, Brazilian music. Uh, and uh, at the Warhol party, there's, um, there's obviously some, you know, John Cale of the Velvet Underground wrote the score for this and for American Psycho. So there's sort of darker Velvet Underground music. Um, in the score, that kind of thing. But at the party, there's um, Do You Believe in Magic, which was a big, you know, late 60s pop hit. So, you know, you're trying to get the uh, music for, for to create fun in a dark, dark world. And, uh, um, and then it's, I would have just, you know, there, but there's all kinds of different, music that evokes a mood. There's the scene where we use um, Dionne Warwick's Walk On By, and that's for Candy Darling, who's who's dreaming of getting a sex change, you know, you know, transitioning. Um, and uh, it's evoking all her, her, the poignancy of her dreams and her present unhappy, you know, her rom- it's sort of romantic. And, um, you know, music can just amplify so much. Um, in, term, in terms of sound, I think that the more abstract something is, the more sound design happens. And there's been a, uh, a I didn't want to show this scene from Eric Cycle because it's the, the most commonly shown scene from the film and it's all over the YouTube in different parodies, which I enjoy very much. But there's the business card scene, much parodied. Um, and 
in that, the sound effects of the cards coming out are really brilliantly done by this by the uh, sound design team, and they were um, they used kind of uh, swords like the swoosh of an actual like Japanese sword uh, to create the sound of the card being taken out. So there's various uh, um, amplified sounds to make these moments kind of you know. Um, Abs more kind of abs using those sounds in a kind of abstract way. Um, and the other thing that is was very subtle and wouldn't even be noticed, but it's important is in Bateman's apartment, there is no sound from the outside world at all. Um, but what there is are these tones like she can find in the library, Arctic wind, you know? Um, so there's these, these, so it's never just a neutral tone, but there's a tone of like a slight, like cold wind blowing through, things like that. That's important. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Jules El Vargas, so I really admire your directing, including on Alias Grace. With more female characters and diversity in today's television landscape, do you see bigger opportunities for women directors and writers from different cultural backgrounds to tell unique stories featuring diverse females? Um, Yes, yes. I, I, you know, I'm, um, I think I'm actually, an, although my films are kind of dark, I'm kind of an optimist. And I really do feel this is a, a wonderful era uh, for young women getting into, or older women, for that matter, um, uh, trying to get into film or wanting to, to create stories. Because um, one of the advantages is that there are so many venues now. You know, it's very hard to get a movie made but there's all kinds of things that can happen on web series or on, you know, um, TV of different kinds, you know, cable to, you know, whatever Netflix is doing. Um, it's, it's never going to be easy uh, to get a film made. And the more unusual, the harder it is. It's funny, when I worked in television, I would kind of know I had an interesting idea if I brought it to the producers and they went, oh, no, really? No, you wanted to do that? No. And I was like, oh, that must be something interesting. If they said yes, great. I thought, oh, that must be kind of conventional and boring because uh, it's just what, like what they've heard before. So, you know, there is enormous, I have an enormous resistance to everything I try and do. Uh, and it doesn't really matter how much you've done. The resistance continues and it's very hard to get financing and all the rest. But, but when I look back from when I started, or well, when I was young and there was nobody, you know, there was hardly anybody. Who was there? There was Jane, Jane Campion. It's like, and who else, you know? Uh, and and, and uh, Andrew Holland or somebody, you know, but there was like three directors that everybody would mention. Yes, there, there was really, you know, um, just a, a handful of people in, in Europe and around the world. And, um, and America was particularly bad. Um, for um, for the role of women filmmakers, and now there's there's so many people, and there's so many films that that I've admired recently. You know, uh, some of my favorite films from from around the world. Um, so I think, and I think there there's a there's a certain there's a little bit of advice that I've always found, and I found this in punk for, and I learned that lesson back then. That there's a moment of cultural uncertainty. This happened in punk when there was a lot of little record labels and they started being successful and the record industry for a short period got sort of turned upside down. And the major labels felt, oh, we don't know what's popular. We don't know what's gonna be successful. So that allowed a lot of smaller people to come in for a short time, you know, and it happened with hip hop. You saw that there was a lot of little labels. And then eventually there's corporate control is already taken it's always taken. It's a story of democracy, really. A little ferment and, and things bubbling up from, from below and then people come saying, but right now I feel there is a lot of ferment. People don't know and people are worried. People don't want to be seen as racist right now. People are scared of that. People are scared of being seen as sexist. Well, that's an advantage for anybody trying to make a story, you know, of, 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 of something diverse, you know, because people are kind of thinking, oh, I guess we ought to do that. We haven't been. So, you know, if you approach it with um, knowing that it's a hard road and, and, and uh, there are always a great deal of disappointment and refute rejection, that's just the life of making films. I think it's a, a wonderful time for, for young directors. For any, I don't want to say young because there are older women too, or older, Per, older people. I don't want to. It's not just women. It's all kinds of people who haven't had a voice. It's a good time to jump in now. 
think that's a great hopeful moment to conclude the master class. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody, um, for watching. So we have uh, tomorrow and Thursday at 6 p.m. our public event. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Charlie Says, not only about Charlie Says, but we're going to show, show parts of Charlie Says and uh, talk more about filmmaking with Mary Heron. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And um, any questions that I didn't answer, maybe I can get to them then. Thanks. Thank you.